Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about driving professionals or being a professional driver and what you need to do to reach that goal and stay crash free and drive defensively for the purposes of your driving career and not getting into altercations with other drivers. So we're going to talk about that tonight. We're also going to talk a little bit about uh, some of my <laughs> recent driving uh, adventures that I've had here on Smart Drive Test as well. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the smart drivers who are passing their licensing let us and letting us know here on Smart Drive Test because we've had a great many successes in the last week and whatnot. We're probably having four or five uh, smart drivers a day telling us uh, that they passed their road test and that's really great. And uh, I'll put up the link in the description there for the map of success. I started uh, putting everybody onto a map, a Google map, and uh, all the people who have been successful in passing their road test. I put them up on there when they let me know and tell me where they are in the world and those types of things. So lots of great information and we're going to answer any questions you have tonight about uh, passing a road test, any questions you have about pursuing a CDL license or remaining crash free. So that's what we're doing tonight. Ryan is here. How are you? Uh, so Ryan has started his first day of truck driving school. Can any tips to be successful? So Ryan, for the purposes of your CDL training in a truck, uh, there are five basic components uh, in CDL school. So it's basically the top one in my mind uh, for tractor trader is turning. So getting the vehicle around corners and those types of things, especially uh, the, the right hand corners. Uh, next one is um, pre-trip inspection and then shifting. And then the two minor ones, depending on which licensing authority you're going to be going to, are going to be backing up and uh, Coupling and uncoupling. Coupling and uncoupling is fairly straightforward, but depending on the licensing center, because when I uh, trained in London, Ontario, Canada, uh, they had to back around a right-hand corner. Uh, here in Vernon, British Columbia, it's a straight back. And when I trained in Victoria, British Columbia, for the purposes of a CDL license, it was a parallel park, which tended to be a lot more challenging for CDL drivers going for a road test. So those are the main components that you have. So turning, pre-trip inspection, shifting a non-synchromesh transmission, uh, backing up and then hook and unhook are going to be your most difficult for the CDL license. But essentially, uh, just hang in there for the first three days because the th first three days are really overwhelming. But let me tell you that after the first three days, it's simply wash, rinse, repeat. You're just doing the same thing over and over again. But in the first three days, most of the driving schools will throw you into everything and you have to be able to sort of take that on. But just hang in there for the first three days, okay? So Paul is here. Paul Lacouche, I'm 47. I've had a Class G license since I was 18. After 26 uh, working in an office, I am starting an AZ course in two weeks. Congratulations, Paul. Uh, Paul, where are you starting your AZ in a couple of weeks there? Uh, Jicklar, one of those that got my license recently. Congratulations. Uh, Hall Phase is here. Anita's here. Christopher, I have a question to you. Why, when you start learning how to drive, they tell you to use one leg, not both legs? Uh, wa watching from uh, Washington State. Now, Christopher, when you're talking about driving, you're talking about uh, just using your right foot on the throttle and the brake. Is that the question that you're asking me? Azoth, I like your U-turn signs, it reflects to life. <laughs> Thanks Azoth, yes, uh, I was down, uh, there's a toy store here in town, it's kind of a toy store education store with my kids, and my kids go in and look at the Lego, and I was up the back there and I found these signs up there and I thought they were really appropriate uh, and really good um, backdrop for my for my live streams and really, you know, it. It, it really is about life and it's one of the things that I tell students that no matter what you're learning uh, you, you have to show up right you have to do the work and just showing up for a lot of people is probably the hardest part and I mean you know when I did my doctorate it was the same thing I showed up I got up in the morning at four o'clock I made coffee I went down and sat in front of in front of my computer right every morning I did the same thing some mornings I'd even turn the computer on and do some writing but you know, you show up. That's how you do the work and you are successful. So, yes, thank you. Uh, Smith Falls, Ontario. There you go. So, um, I know where Smith Falls is. Just remind me, Paul, where Smith Roads is, uh, where Smith Falls there is in, in Ontario. Uh, Ibukun, hi there. Epic uh, 112, good tips, Rick. And I find it helpful to practice with cones as a preparation for the road test. Uh, for right turning vehicle on a divided highway, do I stop or slow down in the right lane? Um, 
Now, it depends, Epic, when there's a right-turning vehicle and you're on a highway, is it a multi-lane or a single lane? Because if it's multi-lane, sometimes you can just get out and pass and you don't have to stop. Uh, and on other times, you're going to have to obviously slow down and, and wait for them to turn, but yes. Okay, okay, yes, Paul, south of Ottawa, that's right. That's why it rings a bell, because I lived in Ottawa for a period of time. There we go. So, yeah, congratulations on that, and that's going to be really great for you, Ryan. Um... Thank you so much, Ryan, for the compliment. That's really great. I'm glad we're able to help you out in those types of things. And if you have any questions while you're driving, uh, when you're taking your uh, class one training there, by all means, get in touch, leave a comment. More than happy to help you out in those types of things. Uh, first time I'm catching one of these live. Jickler, well, welcome to the live stream. We're really glad that you're here. And uh, I got a presentation for you here on professionalism and a few things I'd just like you to keep in mind. Uh, and I'll talk about that. And uh, I can't, unfortunately... Yeah, okay, so epic multi-lane. I'll just come back to that question here. Uh, oh, cones is a preparation. Yes, so epic, that is really good information about practicing. And Corey will put up the video here for you on uh, learning how to drive and a couple of exercises with the uh, one meter tall, 36 inch tall meter pylons uh, and practicing how to you know work the primary controls when you're in the parking lot, the steering wheel, the throttle, and the brake. And that is really good for getting you comfortable with the car, teaching you where the vehicle is in space and place, telling, showing you how much it turns when you turn the steering wheel, getting used to the throttle and the brake, and that's a good place to start. And then exactly what you're talking about, uh, Epic, for the purposes of a road test, if you're on a multi-lane and there's a vehicle turning right in front of you, if they give you enough warning, oftentimes you can just get out, get out move over to the other lane, and then that way that's not going to impede your flow. Now, it, it's going to be a discretionary thing because if the examiner says to you, listen, I want you to make a right-hand turn just up the road here a little bit, then you will stay behind the vehicle and wait. But again, it's going to be one of those little bit of a discretionary thing in terms of uh, where you are on the road and what, if, what directions the examiner gives you. But if the examiner doesn't say anything to you, and this is one of the things I'll tell everybody who's preparing for a road test, whether you're preparing for a passenger vehicle road test or a commercial vehicle license, it doesn't matter. If the examiner doesn't say anything to you, then just continue to proceed straight. That's what you want to do for the purposes of a road test. Just continue to proceed straight. Uh, Christopher, I like to watch your videos. Thanks for helping many people around the States. God bless you. Thank you so much, Christopher, for that compliment. I'm really, it really, you know, fills my bucket, so to, so to speak. It's a kid's story about doing nice things for other people. And I'm really glad that this can help a lot of people and, and, uh, with all the students out of school for summer holidays and those types of things, the channel has really taken off in the last few couple of weeks. And uh, actually, we had a milestone just uh, just yesterday. We hit 3 million minutes of watch time in the last 28 days. So that's 2,000 days of watch time in 28 days. So we just had another milestone, which is really great. And thank you, everyone who's been watching the videos and being successful on your road test, okay? Alan, I have a question about downhill grades with the Jake brake. How do I submit that uh, for another time? Uh, Alan, actually, uh, you can talk about that now. Jake brake, uh, downhill braking. There is a video here that will help you out. Um, uh, downhill braking for commercial vehicles with the Jake brake on. Uh, if you have a question, just fire away. I'm more than happy to help you out with that question on downhill braking because there's, a, there's, uh, there, there's some... <laughs> confusion about how to downhill brake and with advances in technology, particularly engine brake technology, advances in uh, Jake brake technology, it's, it's called Jake brake, it's, Jacobs was the first one to invent an engine brake and it's actually called a, an engine brake, but the brand name has become synonymous with the Jake brake, with the engine brake rather. There's also exhaust brakes, uh, driveline retarders, electric and hydraulic, and those tend to be more popular in Europe, but here in Canada and North America, it tends to be the um, engine brakes and the um, exhaust brakes, the exhaust retarders. Those, that technology is really good, and if you get in the right gear to go down over a hill and you're hauling tandem tandem at say 80,000 pounds, uh, then what's going to happen is you're going to be in the right gear and you're going to be able to go down that hill and you're going to be able to not need to use the service brakes. You're just going to be able to use the uh, engine engine brake and that'll get you down over the hill there. Okay. Oh, and of course my mouse goes out. <laughs> yes. Not sure why the mouse disconnected here. I'm trying to get it going again. I just turned it off here. Okay, so Anita, your program helps a lot of people. Thank you so much, Anita. 
Paul, I've been watching a lot of your videos and watching dash cam accidents. Definitely want a dash cam. Speed seems to be always the culprit for CDL drivers getting into trouble. Actually, Paul, um, yeah, connection lost. Of course, the connection's been lost. Uh, Paul, one of the things I would say for CDL drivers is, is it's not speed. I would say that they're following too close because the, the fundamentals of my defensive driving course that I have on special right now over at the Smart Drive Test channel, and I would recommend that some of you go over and have a look at that, is space management. I really believe that space management is the key uh, component to being able to drive defensively and remain crash free. Because if you're not near anything, you're not near other road users and you're not near other fixed objects, it's less likely that you're going to hit them. So those people who are speeding, as you said, Paul, and it is one of the top reasons why people are involved in collisions, but I would argue that it's poor space management that contributes more so to crashes than it is speed. Because if you're driving at high speeds, and the Autobahn is probably one of the best examples, lots of people drive at high speeds, but everybody on the Autobahn knows that if they're not doing a certain speed, that they do not get in that hammer lane because, uh, you know, the very fast lane, the passing lane, because there are many people who are driving at fast speeds. So I argue that it's space management, it's not speed. And the other one is just failing to give the right of way many many people just believe that they have the right of way and i was there was a uh, unfortunately there was a truck driver on my channel this week and unfortunately i had to delete him because he just wanted to argue with me and we were talking about merging and he sent me a dash cam video and you could clearly see the van coming on the merge lane and that truck driver did not let off the throttle all he had to do was let off the throttle a little bit s slow down two or three miles an hour and that van would have pulled on the freeway right in front of him no he refused he believed that he had the right of way instead of being a professional driver and just letting off the throttle a little bit, carried on and he was even more convinced that he was right because there was a police officer that gave the van a ticket. And I'm like, you know, and this is one of the things I'm gonna talk about professionalism is, is that you can be right or you can be dead right. Just because you've got the right of way doesn't mean that you're gonna be right. And are you gonna push that to the point where you're risking other people's lives? Because that is not safe. And all of us who are here, all of us who are smart drivers, you need to sometimes give up the right of way so that you we can all stay safe on the roads. We can all be defensive drivers. We can all be crash free because as I say, you get involved in a crash, you're risking life and injury. So that's basically what I'm going to say about professionalism. Okay. So, and I can't get my mouse to work and my other mouse is not within quick reach here. So, Oh, that's frustrating. There we go. Okay, mouse is working. Blessed. Aloha, Rick, and everyone just stopping by to say hello. Can't stay. Got to go work now. <laughs> that's excellent, but you have a license now, so that's really great. Uh, that's great. Thanks so much for stopping by, Blessed. Uh, Blanca, thank you so much. Uh, you're freaking awesome. Thank you for all your help. You are most welcome, Blanca. We're really glad that we could help. Christopher, uh, join the live me Apple is so amazing you can you can be getting more people on can watch and you can get more people and get money through people giving you gifts you uh, lots live me well Christopher I'll definitely have a look at that thank you for pointing that out and Paul yeah thanks so much okay Ryan what makes a professional truck driver and I have a very easy definition for this and this is one of the things I'll talk about a little bit more in the presentation but just quickly what I'll say about this is that we as human beings are not biologically de designed to move at speeds faster than 20 or 30 miles an hour. It's just part of our biology. But we have ways, skills and abilities and techniques that we put in place when we drive cars that compensate for us making errors. And I'll tell you another story about that. But you need to know as a professional driver that other people are going to make mistakes. Do you have habits, skills, and abilities in place that when that other person makes mistakes, you're not, you're not a wreck on a wreck, okay? For example, that truck driver, he saw that van like a half a mile before the, the van moved out onto the freeway. What made that driver unprofessional was the fact that that driver believed that he was right and he had the right of way and he wasn't going to give that up and he was going to risk other people's lives to prove his point. So... My very fundamental definition of professional drivers are drivers that know that other people on the roadway are going to make mistakes and you have skills, abilities, and techniques in place that are going to keep you safe and the rest of the driving public safe on the roadway and prevent traffic crashes. And sometimes that's simply a matter of you giving up 
the right of way or taking your foot off the throttle a little bit and slowing down. That's what a professional driver is. A professional driver knows that other people are going to make mistakes and you're simply going to compensate for those other people making mistakes. That's it. Okay. Uh, Liam, is there any way I can prevent being merged into on the parkway? Some of the entrances are extremely short with yield or stop signs and people just shove their way in. I'm almost, I've almost been sideswiped. Yes. Liam, unfortunately that's going to happen. Now, one of the things that I'll tell you, Liam, about merging is when you're on the parkway, take note of where the exit uh, off ramps and on ramps are. And if you know where the on ramps and exits are going to be, and oftentimes they're accompanied with an overpass, if you take note of where those are and you can get over to the outside lane on the parkway, first of all, that's going to make you a lot safer because then you're not going to be in that inside right lane when other people are trying to merge. And the other thing is, is that when you get up there, monitor your speed. Most of the time, people are going to merge all right and they're going to get going in those types of things. But oftentimes, if you just take your foot off the throttle two or three miles an hour and slow down enough for that, that's simply going to allow you to merge out onto the roadway. But the first and foremost thing to keep yourself safe and drive defensively is take note of where the off ramps are, take note of where the on ramps are, and know that the vehicles are going to be coming out there. And if you can, get over to the other lane. And oftentimes you can see those half a mile down the parkway, right? So half a mile down the parkway, just mer merge out to the left-hand lane and carry on. And then the other traffic can just merge out onto the freeway. Okay. Uh... Okay, Christopher, yep, definitely I'll have a look at that. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna head over to the presentation and I'll make sure I put the presentation up this week because I know last week I forgot to transition it over. So you didn't actually get to see the, the presentation. So we'll get that. And as I said, again, uh, I can't answer questions during the presentation, but I'll come back and I'll go through all the questions and those types of things. Uh, Land Santa, I got to say I love your channel, but could give some idea about freeway road signs. Uh, yes, and I'll come back to that question, Lance, and as soon as I finish the presentation here, I'll do that for you, okay? So, here we go. There we go. Okay, and definitely transitioning this time. So, tonight we're talking about being a professional driver, and we already talked about this a little bit in the sort of preamble here and answering some questions for smart drivers. Professional drivers are drivers that know that other people are going to make mistakes. It's not a matter of if they're going to make mistakes, but rather when. So when somebody does cut you off or takes the space in front of your vehicle and around your vehicle, you're simply going to say, oh, that happened. Let them go on with their life and have their crash somewhere else. That's the definition of a professional driver. So page down, page down. <laughs> yes, and it's not working. There we go. Let's try this again. Oh, yes. Excellent. Bear with me here. I'm having some technical problems. Keynote crashed on me. Because... Alright. Sorry about that. What happened was the disk came un plugged here <laughs> and hopefully it'll ramp up here in a minute all right well we'll go back to answering some questions here oh there we go okay I'll try this again there we go Sorry about this. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, just get the camera fixed here. There we go. Okay, uh, my name is Rick August. I do have a PhD. I was a truck driver through most of the 1990s. I ran LTL freight into the United States, mostly uh, east of the Mississippi, but I was in other states, California, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, places like that. And LTL freight is less than load, which essentially means that you got five or six drops on a trailer. Uh, in 1997, I became a licensed commercial driving instructor, and most of my driver education career has been with commercial vehicles, especially trucks. I have done some buses as well, and my expertise is in air brakes. And hopefully by the beginning of August, I will have my book out 
uh, which is uh, Air Brakes Explained Simply, which is a manual for truck drivers. It's really, I'm really excited about it. It's, it gives you step-by-step -step instructions for doing your pre-trip inspection, good explanations of air brake systems, and I completely revolutionized the course, which unfortunately governments up until this point have been reluctant to change and fix because unfortunately you're still teaching 40-year-old air brake courses and many students are confused by those 40-year-old air brake courses. Uh, I have a doctorate in legal history I've, uh, with a specialty in policing, especially as it relates to traffic. I finished that in 2006, and while I was in Australia, it was where I did my graduate work. Uh, I drove buses for Greyhound and V-Line there in Australia, so I have bus experience as well. All right, so trailering gone wrong. So last week I was working with a friend of mine doing some renovations, and I had to pull the trailer to the dump for all the stuff we pulled out of the house. and. Uh, trailering kind of went wrong that day. Uh, I was parked tightly behind, beside another trailer and I had somebody spotting me and this is the thing about trailering or maneuvering in tight spaces. If you do have somebody else who's trying to help you out, maybe the other person isn't helping you out as well as they should be. Unfortunately, I did ding the trailer beside me because I got into it and the trailer, the person for whatever reason didn't tell me to stop. And, uh, which kind of annoyed me because that was the reason you have spotters. But anyway, so that happened. And then uh, this trailer has a kind of a, an odd thing going on with it where the latch on the tongue doesn't quite work sometimes and the trailer comes unhooked from the truck. Well, I got into the dump and I was throwing the stuff out and, the, and I drove over to the next pile because it was wood and garbage. And I pulled over to the garbage pile and the trailer would come unhooked from the back of the trailer. <laughs> but... Uh, I have enough experience with trailering that as soon as the trailer came off and it's kind of bouncing on the chains, I knew that the trailer had come unhooked. So that happened and then I got the trailer unloaded, I went back, I backed it back in and I unhooked the trailer and uh, when I went to pull away I forgot to unhook the safety chains because I was kind of rattled by this point. <laughs> and, uh, but the, my point is, is that you're going to make mistakes when you're driving. Even when you're experienced and you've been driving for a while and things are just going to go wrong. It's like, it's like I said to my mate who says, I, I thought you were a professional driver, blah, blah, blah. And he's having a kind of a dig at me, right? And I said, you know, I haven't had anything happen for like six years. And then in one day, I have three things go wrong. So it was kind of funny. But the point about being a professional driver is, is that there were techniques and skills that I had put in place that minimized the damage. And there wasn't any threat to anybody else. First of all, when I was trying to get the trailer out, jockeying the trailer out, I was going really slowly. So the damage to the other unit was minimal. And this is one of the things that applies to not only trailer, but also when you're turning or you're around other people or you're in tight spaces with your vehicle, go slowly. That way you have time to observe, you have time to maneuver the vehicle, you have time to work the controls of the vehicle. And if you are unfortunate to hit something as I did, you're gonna do minimal damage. And as well, sometimes in most cases, you're gonna be able to get the unit stopped. So go slowly. And the other thing was, is I have enough experience when the trailer come back off the back of the truck, it wasn't a big deal. I was in the dump, I was going slowly, and I knew right away. So I just got out, hooked it on properly, and carried on. And then lastly, when I pulled away from the trailer, anytime you're pulling a trailer, or you're in tight confines and those types of things, don't just unhook the trailer and then go tearing off. <laughs> Go slowly because if something happens, as happened to me, and the ch I forgot to unhook the chains because I was kind of rattled by that point. It was just a matter of, oh, I tightened up against the chains. I knew something was wrong because the trailer was blocked and it didn't come with me. Uh, then I knew, right? So I was going slowly and I had put habits and skills and abilities in place that prevented damage, injury to other people, or any risk to other people who were in and around the area. So that's one thing that I want to say. Now, we've talked a little bit about road rage. We had a question about getting onto on-ramps that people are charging out onto the freeway and those types of things. People are not merging properly when they're getting out onto the freeway because they're not picking their spot, they're not adjusting their speed properly, and they're just forcing their way out onto the roadway. And I have quite a number of questions from new drivers, particularly who have difficulty with lane merging. You need to know the different parts of the on-ramps and those types of things. And yes, some of these acceleration lanes are quite short and you're gonna have to put the pedal to the metal and you're gonna have to get it up to speed. Uh, I do recommend that as you're coming out on the on-ramp, because oftentimes the on-ramp is part of the acceleration lane and you can get some speed up on the on the on-ramp before you hit the acceleration lane. But be looking for your spot, be picking your spot and adjusting your speed as you're coming out onto the freeway. If the person's speeding up and trying to get past you, then, then reduce your speed and pull in behind them. If the person's going slower, maintaining their speed, then get lots of speed up and get in front of them and pull out. 
as well continuity lines know that continuity lines are half as long and twice as wide as normal road markings if you have continuity lines here in north america or for those of you who drive on the uh, right side of the road if they're on the left side of your vehicle know that the lane that you're in is either going to end or it's going to exit so those are continuity lines so that's a little bit about merging onto freeways and those types of things and road rage and just as a as a another incident last week i was driving in vernon here and i had some space in front of me i was right at an intersection and somebody cut right off in front of me and you know i i was talking to sebastian about this another smart driver and i was annoyed i was very annoyed with the person and i had an inclination to follow them into the parking lot they turned into and go and say to them, hey mate you know really that was dangerous and you know there are other people and you maybe you need to know that there are people have dash cams because i caught it on my dash cam so know that driving is a social activity and part of being a professional driver is knowing that other people are going to make mistakes like the person who cut me off but we can choose how we react to that person do we just let that person go off and have their crash somewhere else yes in most cases 98 percent of cases that is going to be your best option to just let them go off and have their crash somewhere else so that's one of the sign uh, hallmarks of being a professional driver getting on and off freeways we've already talked about that uh, when you're on highways and you're in town and those types of places, drive in the spaces between the clusters of vehicles. Unfortunately, everything in the driving environment tells us to drive incorrectly. We follow too close. We don't manage space around our vehicles. And I was talking about this previously uh, with Paul about space management. Uh, he was saying that most CDL vehicles get into crashes because they're speeding. They're Not only are they speeding, but this, it's they're traveling too fast and they're not managing space around their vehicle because my firm belief is is that if you're not near other road users you're not near fixed objects it's less likely that you're going to hit something regardless of how fast you're going so don't follow other traffic don't drive closely to other traffic in the driving environment resist the urge to be close to other people resist the urge to pull right up the traffic when you're stopped in traffic resist the urge to pull right out into the intersection on a left hand turn these skills and abilities are going to keep you safe when you're driving. If you're not driving faster, you're not comfortable driving with the traffic flow, then drive in the right lane and drive the posted speed limit. And then the other thing is, is that signals are to tell other drivers that you wish to move over, that you wish to turn. It's to request help from other drivers on the roadway. And oftentimes people will say to me, oh, people won't let me over when I'm trying to merge. But they don't activate their signal. They don't ask other drivers to let them move over and you have to signal it's the same thing when you're merging on a freeway get your signal on as soon as you get onto the on-ramp that way it's going to attract the attention of other drivers signals are to ask other people and request other people to help you out to merge to turn to move the vehicle laterally whatever you're going to do so and again i talked about controlling your actions or your reaction to your annoyance to other drivers on the roadway it's simply knowing that other people are going to cut you off and they're going to make mistakes so drivers are going to make mistakes and again i come back to the uh, example i told you about the driver that i was having an argument with on the channel this week who believed that he was right that he had the right he was on the freeway and he had the right of way well unfortunately he doesn't have the right of way and he as a professional driver he should have just let his foot off the throttle a little bit and let the van pull in in front of him and then there would have been no risk to himself, no risk to other drivers on the roadway, and no one would have been in danger. So sometimes you have to give up the right of way. And again, it comes back to the story that I really like about the person who's moving to Chicago from New York, and he runs into this guy who lives in Chicago, and he says to the people in Chicago, he says to the person who's from Chicago, he says, oh, how do you find the people in Chicago? And the guy says, oh, he says, oh, they're all right, and this and that. He says, well, how do you find the people in New York? He asked them back. He says, how do you find the people in New York? He says, oh, you know, they're rude, they're arrogant, they're always cutting you off, it's me first attitude, those types of things. And the guy from Chicago looks at him, he says, well, he says, you know something, I suspect you'll find the people in Chicago the same. It's kind of that saying that no matter where we go, there we are. And if you think that other drivers are going to be arrogant, they're going to be rude, and that you got to drive and you got to be aggressive, that's what you're going to find in the driving environment. Whereas if you back off, manage your space well manage your speed well are considerate to other drivers help other drivers to turn or help other drivers to get out onto the roadway and help other drivers merge and those types of things you're going to find that you get that energy back in kind and then finally what i would like to say about being a professional driver is, is know that no one is immune from road crashes we all know somebody who's been involved in a crash if they haven't sustained permanent injury and they haven't been killed 
then they're probably one of the lucky ones. But no, uh, James Dean died in a car crash. Princess Diana died in a car crash. And Tim Horton, famous coffee shop hockey player here, also died in a car crash. So no one is immune from car crashes. So know that other people are going to make mistakes and you've got skills, abilities, and techniques in place that keep you safe and keep you from being a wreck on a wreck because there's always consequences to car crashes. There's going to be property damage, there's going to be injuries, and if there isn't injury or death and you're lucky enough for that and you simply got to deal with insurance companies, you got to deal with bureaucracy and get your vehicle fixed, all that time and energy, is it really worth it for just you taking your, lifting your foot off the throttle or slowing down a little bit? to let other people in front of you and let them go off and have their crash somewhere else. So think about the consequences of having a car crash and being professional when you're driving. So if you've got a test coming up, good luck on that. For those of you who passed in a little while, congratulations. And we'll head back over here and we'll answer questions. And thank you for your patience and bearing with me there when I had some technical challenges and getting everything going here. So we'll head back over here. There we go. Okay, so lots of questions. Disconnect. My road test is tomorrow. Yes, so remember to breathe. <laughs> yes, it is a bit daunting with your road test coming up tomorrow and the unknown, but know that if you've been watching the videos here, you're going to do great on your road test tomorrow. It's going to be awesome. Idris, uh, when you're on a highway, how will I control the blind spot car? All right, so Idris, when you're on a highway, you don't want to be near other vehicles. You want to keep space around your vehicle, and that's one of the ways excuse me, that you're going to be dealing with vehicles that are potentially in your blind spots. Now, also, some of you may know that with newer vehicles, you're going to have uh, blind spot indicators. It, uh, I was driving a Nissan Murano, and on the Nissan Murano, they're down uh, just uh, in front of the steering wheel on the two sides of the vehicle. Uh, the other place, and sorry, I moved this for you. There we go. Now, I got that right. Last week it was the other thing I forgot to transition. This week it was this. So, um, and another vehicle, a Subaru, they're on the mirrors. So those blind spot uh, detectors are really good. I really like those. The other thing is the shoulder check. When you're on the highway, shoulder check, that's going to get you seeing other vehicles around your vehicles and check your mirrors. And if you're not comfortable with shoulder checking, then get yourself some of those little convex mirrors and that'll keep the vehicles out of your blind spots. All right. So, excellent. Azoth, how much distance should you be from a semi-tractor if you're behind it? Three to five seconds is a good. Uh, thanks, Nicholas, for that. Uh, as well, it kind of depends, Azoth, if you can see around the truck. Sometimes you might have to actually make that farther back so that you can see around the vehicle because semi-trailers are really big, and it kind of depends on your ability to see past the truck is going to determine how far back. Uh, Rush Girl, accidentally wound up in a really deep ditch after I got the panicking over with I somehow managed to get out but I really damaged the muffler is there a way to get out other than towing uh, rush girl there are some other ways of getting out but most of the time if you're kind of stuck uh, one of the things that tow truck drivers will tell you and I have a good mate I'm gonna go and uh, uh, I'm gonna do an interview with Dave uh, if you do get stuck and you're stuck, don't spin the tires. Don't dig it in deeper because that's just going to make it harder to pull out. And when you make it harder to pull out, you're going to do more damage to the vehicle. <coughs> excuse me. But, excuse me here. As you said, sometimes the underbody of the vehicle is going to get damaged and you unfortunately you're going to have to fix the muffler. Now, if you get stuck in the winter time or those types of things, there are uh, slip mats that you can put underneath the tires and that will help you get out and those types of things. But sometimes you just need to get towed out and that's going to be your best option. But unfortunately, as you said, it's going to do damage to the muffler and other parts of the vehicle and whatnot. So, Eric, any info, internet job sites for Canadian oil field uh, driving jobs? Uh, Eric, the best way that you're going to find driving jobs in the oil field is to start contacting people. And start talking to different companies who are up there and one of the questions that you ask if they don't have any jobs available for that particular company know that all of these companies know one another and simply say to them if they say no we don't have any um, we don't have any jobs available then say to them listen do you know anybody else I can contact or anybody I can talk to because uh, have a look at the video with Bill Walker there about how he got a job and how he did uh, cold calling and he 
did networking with people. Essentially, he got in touch with somebody whose son was working as a mechanic in the oil fields. Uh, he got the number of his son who was working as a mechanic. He got in touch with him. He was able to put him in touch with somebody else. And I think by the time he made five or six phone calls, he had actually got a secured a job in the oil fields. So it's just a matter of getting out, getting on the phone and talking to people. And if you're uncomfortable with talking on the phone and cold calling people, Eric, one of the things that I find really helps is, is that when I'm cold calling and when I'm interviewing people and those types of things, one of the things I find helps is to stand up and rehearse your little spiel that you want to talk to people and those types of things. And people will always help you out to be able to find a job. So know that that's one of the best ways to do that. Uh, do, do, do. Len Santa, how to navigate Canadian freeway road signs and exit numbers. Yes, uh, Corey got the video up for you. Excellent, I have massive Eric. Uh, anxiety, how do I deal with this when driving? And Eric, look at the video on fear and anxiety, but one of the things is exposure to the vehicle, sitting in the vehicle. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Corey. There we go, yep, I got it. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so just exposure to the vehicle, getting in the vehicle, backing up, driving in parking lots and those types of things with the cones and whatnot, all of that's going to help you out. It's just a matter of exposure and little bits and give yourself credit for each time that you do that. Give yourself control for, or give yourself, reward yourself for your little successes and know that it's going to be those little successes that are going to climb the ladder to being successful and getting over your anxiety. Laura, uh, does cruise control save fuel? Yes, it does save fuel, Laura, for sure. Uh, studies have shown that cruise control can save you 15 to 20% uh, in, uh, in fuel economy, improve your fuel economy by that much. Okay. Patrick, can you get a learner's permit on a canceled driver's license? Uh, uh, Patrick, where are you that you're trying to get a learner's license with a, and what class of license are you going for? Uh, Eric, how to go through a bridge road that is curved badly. <laughs> yeah, Rush Girl, that may have been why uh, there was damage to the muffler because you, you spun the tires and you dug down farther. How to go through. Okay, so Eric, what you want to look at is you want to look at the video on curvy roads. That will help you with the bridge. Okay, Alan, there's a grade that I downshift one once empty to climb. Coming home, I'm loaded at 75K, so I downshift twice coming down with the Jake on. Uh, Alan, what is uh, what transmission do you have in the truck? Most of the time when you're loaded, you got 75,000K on. And the other thing I need to know, Alan, is, is what is the grade of the hill and how long is the hill? How long is it? Like, is it two miles? Is it three miles? Okay. Uh, Laura, is it safe to drive cruise control while driving on the highway? Absolutely, Laura. Yes. And have a look at the video on driving on the highway. Now, one of the other things, Laura, uh, I had somebody say I have a comment last week that you should never use cruise control in the rain. That's not true. If it is raining heavily, then yes, don't use cruise control. But if it's raining moderately and you've got good tires on your vehicle that have good tread, then you can use cruise control. I use cruise control all the time in the rain. I'm, now, if it's raining heavily, obviously I don't put cruise control on, but if you've got bald tires on your vehicle, a couple of years ago I was trying to get the last little bits of life out of my tires and they were fairly bald. And it didn't matter how hard it rained, that vehicle was prone to, to, um, to hydroplaning. So most cruise controls and most vehicles are now are going to have a cancel button as well as the you know set and um, resume button and just you know hover your finger over that cruise over that cancel button and then if something does happen you can hit the cancel button right away uh, some of the older vehicles if they're manual transmission you want to touch the clutch you want to try to avoid hitting the brakes to disengage cruise control on your vehicle that's not the best reaction because if you're already in a slippery condition or you're potentially going to lose control the last thing you want to do is hit the brakes you want to try and hit the cancel button on the cruise so it's always a good idea to sort of hover your thumb over the cruise control button because it is there on the steering wheel Okay, uh, Ibukun, is it a good habit to drive barefooted? No, Ibukun, it's not a good habit to drive barefooted while you're operating a motor vehicle. Most of the manuals do recommend that you have shoes on and wear comfortable shoes. And this is good for uh, my two smart drivers who are going for their CDL license. Don't show up with work boots the first days that you're going in for your driving lessons. The school may have already told you, show up with trainers on, running shoes. 
running shoes are best because they're going to give you good contact with the pedals and uh, even when you're driving a passenger vehicle much better contact with the, with the pedals much more control of the pedals the throttle and the brake and for those of you going for a CDL license and learning how to shift the non-synchromesh transmission you want to have good contact with the pedals because what the transition that you're going to make is instead of pushing the clutch all the way to the floor you're going to learn to push it in one inch which is going to be a bit of a change for you so wear comfortable shoes trainers when you start training especially for those of you in a CDL vehicle okay uh, Eric I live in rural America some of my highways are really narrow sometimes oversized trailers drive through any tips uh, yes uh, you just simply want to slow down Eric you want to look farther down the road and uh, if there are oversized vehicles on the roadway if you can't squeeze over enough to let the oversized vehicle come through then what I suggest to you is to simply stop okay let the oversized vehicle go by and then carry on and I do know some of those roads that you're talking about in rural America because I've been on those roads and I've been on those roads in tractor trailer units and when you're in a big unit like a tractor trailer unit sometimes you're coming around the corners and you are deviating into the other lane simply because of the off tracking and the size of the vehicle it's just something that cannot be avoided so know that for the purposes of driving on these roadways and as I tell drivers not only for the purposes of a road test but also for the purposes of safe driving anytime you get into a situation or a scenario where you're not comfortable you don't feel that there's enough room simply move over and stop and wait for other road users or wait for whatever is in your way to move out of the way and that way you're going to stay safe okay Renee thanks Rick I uh, just passed my knowledge test I've been driving over five years outside Alberta how do I handle the class 5 advanced road test in Alberta okay so Renee the class 5 road test it's the advanced road test is simply it's similar to the first road test that you're going to take except as the advanced road test they, they simply expect you to be smoother with the vehicle they, they expect you to have advanced abilities to control the throttle to control the brake and to control the steering wheel you also need to know to do all of the maneuvers and Corey will get the uh, slow speed maneuver playlist for you and it's simply two point reverse turn parallel parking uh, reversing the vehicle in a straight line uh, reverse stall parking so you have to be able to do all of those slow speed maneuvers and do them fairly well and again Renee it's not about doing the road test perfectly but being able to do it well enough that you have shown that you've had some driving experience that's simply what they're looking for now again and this goes back to the CDL drivers and other people who are going for road tests as well all road tests consists of the same four basic fundamentals speed management space management observation and communication and this is also the fundamentals of defensive driving as well as being able to pass a road test so speed management posted speed speed limit flow of traffic capability of the vehicle and this is the capability of the vehicle is more for CDL drivers who are going to go up a hill and the vehicle won't be able to go as fast as the posted speed limit so again posted speed limit flow of traffic capability of the vehicles whichever is less is the speed that you're going to drive now there are conditions on roadways if you're in a residential and there's lots of parked cars around or you're in a high uh, pedestrian traffic area you can drive slower because the conditions dictate that so that's speed management space management don't get near other road users don't get near fixed objects when you stop in traffic make sure you can see the uh, tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement that's about one vehicle length back when you're in stop traffic and at stop signs stop before the stop line before the crosswalk line if there's no crosswalk line but there's a sidewalk stop before the, the sidewalk and then if you don't have a stop line or crosswalk line stop at the edge where the two roads meet and have a look at that video as well and that'll show you that for the purposes of space management observation so you have to observe you have to have a scanning pattern in place checking your mirrors looking far down the road checking your instrument panel and you need to cycle through that every 8 to 12 seconds as well you need to shoulder check every time you move the vehicle laterally or you turn anytime that you're doing slow speed maneuvers and you back up you have to do a 360 degree scan before you start backing up and you have to look out the back window for CDL drivers you have to look in the mirrors the whole time that you're backing up one of the number one reasons why people get involved in uh, backing crashes is because they don't look out the back window so when you're backing up you need to look out the back window now for those of you doing slow speed maneuvers for the purposes of a road test every vehicle length stop and look forward do a big scan and then continue on with your backing up and then finally uh, communication you need to communicate with other road users and you communicate via your lights your horn uh, hand, hand, 
hand gestures, appropriate hand gestures. Make sure you're waving with all five fingers so that people don't think that you're telling them they're number one because that won't be successful on a road test. And then uh, eye contact with other road users and position of your vehicle on the roadway. All communicate your intentions to other road users. So those are the four fundamental components of a, of a road test. Regardless, it doesn't matter which road test you're taking, whether it's a passenger vehicle or CDL. Speed management, space management, communication, observation. So that's what you need to do for the purposes of a road test. Okay, and Corey's got all those videos up there. That's really great. Emily, I'm a new driver and got my license on the first try. I'm moving to a new state. How does a person drive cross country and avoid collisions on major highways, expressways, and four lane exit ramps? So Emily, what I suggest to you is have a look at the video on freeway or interstates in the United States and how to navigate those. And then have a look at the video on navigation and route planning and plan your route out before you take off. Because I know that your phone will give you all of that information, but you want to have it all planned out and kind of written out first before you take off. And then look at the videos on how to merge and, and uh, exit from limited access highways because that's what you're going to be doing. So Emily, where are you moving from? Which state are you moving from? And which state are you moving to? And just give me an idea how far you're gonna be driving because that sounds very exciting. Okay, Epic, uh, to clarify the earlier question that I posited, it's a right turn vehicle on a multi-lane divided highway. Do I stop or slow down if I were to encounter this scenario? So if it's on a multi-lane scenario, Epic, so what I said was if, if the examiner hasn't given you directions that say, for example, so say for example, the examiner says to you, I want you to turn right at the next intersection and the next intersection is half a kilometer up the road. If your turn is a half a kilometer up the road, then you're simply gonna wait behind the vehicle, let that vehicle turn and then proceed. If the examiner hasn't given you any instructions and you're gonna proceed straight and this vehicle in front of you gave you lots of advance notice, they put their signal on, then you simply change lanes and move out to the left-hand lane and move around the vehicle to let the vehicle turn. That's the two options, and it's going to be up to your discretion. Now, the other fundamental component of doing a road test is demonstrating to the examiner that you have due care and control of the vehicle in changing driving environments, and that's one of the fundamental uh, skills and abilities that you're going to have to demonstrate to the examiner, that you can react appropriately in changing driving conditions. That's what you need to do for the purposes of your road test. So that's going to be a bit of a discretionary thing. There isn't one answer to your question, Epic. It's going to depend on the driving scenario. So, uh, do, do, do. Patrick, how can I keep my driver's license? Uh, Patrick, I don't understand the question in terms of how do you keep your driver's license. Eric, I can currently only drive a big truck. I'm usually more comfortable to small cars uh, for driving tips. Okay, excellent. New York to Washington. New York State to Washington. That's all the way across. That's all the way across the United States. That's awesome. That's a great trip. That's like uh, 3,000 miles, is it? According to Google, somebody would have to Google that for me. Uh, Emily, yeah. So know that that's going to take you three or four days, Emily. And uh, just, you know, take your time. Take breaks every couple of hours and have it planned out so you know where you're going. Most of it, I think you're gonna come across I-90, I-94 is, and I think I'm correct on that. And, uh, you know, try to avoid going into big cities during rush hour. So know that you don't wanna go into the big cities in the morning between sort of seven and nine, and you don't wanna be there in the afternoon between three and five. Try and avoid those times going through the big cities because you're gonna come through Chicago. Uh, you know, Chicago is really the biggest city you're gonna go through. Uh, just know that you don't want to be in there at that time. There are tolls in Chicago if you're going through that way, so it's going to be really great. There you go. Okay. Um, Emily, you're most welcome. Paul, any videos on fixing a missed shift, trailer jackknife and tractor jackknife? Yes, Paul, there is the shifting theory video and missed shifts. 85% of the time on a missed shift in a big truck, you can get the truck into fifth. So know that, Paul for the purposes of a missed ship. Trailer jackknife, um, tractor jackknife. Tractor jackknife, uh, you're gonna wanna get your feet off the pedals. Uh, for trailer jackknife, sometimes you can hit the, the handbrake, but usually not. And most of the time, any time that the truck is going to deviate out of that straight line, basically what you wanna do, Paul, is you wanna get your foot in the throttle and you wanna steer the truck where you wanna go. The unfortunate part is, is that most of the time, it's gonna happen so quickly 
that you're not going to be able to re react fast enough. But what I tell students, and I drill this into them, is, is that anytime you're going around a corner, you want to have power to the wheels. You don't need to be accelerating, but you do need power to the wheels. You want that tractor in front of the trailer, and you want that tractor pulling that trailer. Because anytime that you're not pulling that trailer, that trailer can decide where it wants to go. And if that trailer decides it's going to go somewhere and you're not pulling it, you're going to end up in the rhubarb. So make sure that you have power to the tractor every time that you're going around a corner. Okay. Uh, okay, so Eric, excellent question. Any, any tips for uh, being safer in bigger vehicles? So one of the things you want to do in bigger vehicles, Eric, is, is that when you're passing other vehicles, know that you're going to need a lot more space before you can pull back in in front of other uh, <laughs> other vehicles. Sorry, I was looking at a question here. Somebody was asking me, no, flipping people off is not being professional. <laughs> all, all five fingers when you wave to other people, okay, when you're driving. All right, so Eric, uh, the other thing, Eric, is have a have a look at the video on height of your vehicle. Know that it's going to be 4.15 meters or 13 feet 6 inches in Canada and the United States. So in the United States, it's going to be 13 feet 6. In Canada, it's 4.15. If it doesn't say that height, it's going to be less. You don't want to take the front of your vehicle off, okay? All right, uh, keep your space. Keep lots of space between you and other vehicles, okay? Four to five seconds. Know that you can't run up on them. Know that big trucks, buses, RVs, those types of things are not going to accelerate as fast as other vehicles. So as much as possible, try and drive in the right-hand lane. I know that once in a while you're going to get caught up in those types of things, but try and drive in the right-hand lane because you're not going to accelerate. And as well, space management manage your space around your vehicle. That's going to be the most important thing for the purposes of staying safe. And I just, I, I advocate that as the fundamentals of defensive driving. All right. There you go. So Emily, that sounds like an awesome trip. You're going to have a great time driving across uh, from east to west there in the United States of America. So that's really great. Uh, Stove Nasty, I only play in Rick. <laughs> Keep up the great wake. I tell all my friends about your channel. You're truly the best. Cheers. Many years of safe driving. Thanks, Stove Nasty. That's really awesome compliment. I really appreciate that. So I think we're getting up near the hour here. If anybody else has any questions, I think we're going to wrap that up. And again, I just want to thank everybody, all the smart drivers for watching the channel. I want to thank everybody for the tremendous success the channel is having. Uh, we are well and truly over 100,000 minutes of watch time a day. Uh, in the last 28 days, as I said at the beginning, we hit 3 million minutes of watch time. That's 2,000 days of watch time. So the channel is truly taking off, and it's only because of you, the smart drivers. And I'm really happy to hear that lots of people are passing the road tests, and I'm adding them to the map of success. So have a look at that if you haven't seen that already. And Corey will put up the link here for you. You can go and have a look at that and see all the people all around the world. It's, it gives me a great sense of pride to see that and see all the people around the world have been successful on their road tests. And anybody I can help uh, with uh, passing a road test and being successful and people starting careers as CDL drivers, all of that is really great because I think there's a, a lot of opportunity for people. And if we can help you stay crash free as well and be professional drivers, that's really great too. So we're gonna wrap it up there. Eric, uh, I have social anxiety and tips for me when going to take the test. Lots of practice, Eric. Lots and lots of practice. Because the more you practice, we practice. We When we're under stress and we're anxious, we do what we've practiced. So if you can get as much practice as possible before you go and take your road test, when you get anxious and you're nervous, you're going to do what you've practiced. And if you practice all the skills and abilities and techniques that you need for the purposes of passing your road test, you're going to do it and you're going to do well. Okay? So, uh, Bricks for Wheels, uh, Corey, I was checking out CDL Manual for Manitoba and they claimed that for winter starts you should wait around 10 minutes and think, is this really true for bigger trucks? My understanding that it's not. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Corey, for diesel engines, that, that used to be true, not true so much. That is old information. Most of these large electronic uh, diesels now, they're all electronic diesel engines. Uh, you can let them start up, you can wait a minute for the oil pressure to come up, and then as long as you drive them moderately, they're going to warm up faster. It's the same as your passenger vehicle. Let them warm up for about 30 seconds a minute, oftentimes for the time that it takes you to clean the snow and whatnot off your vehicle, then uh, you're going to warm them up. Now, in big trucks, 
Commercial vehicles, what most people do in the wintertime, what most drivers do is they'll start the vehicle up, they'll let it run. No, I'll back up. They go under the hood, they check the fluids, do all their underhood checks, close the hood, they start the vehicle up, they let their air pressure build up and they walk around it. By that time, the vehicle's warmed up and you're ready to go in a large electronic diesel engine. So that's what you're going to do. Okay, uh, Lansama, uh, Lansana, how long is the process to gaining AZ license after getting Class G? Uh, well, you have to be a certain age to go. I think it's 19 for a Class one, uh, Class AZ license. And then it's four to six weeks at driving school. And I would recommend that you go to driving school for your Class AZ. Okay. Thank you so much, Rush Girl. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, Paul, you're most welcome. Eric, thanks. I'm sure your channel has made an impact on many young people in society. And thank you so much for that, Eric. That's really great. And uh, congratulations to everybody who's passed the road test in the last week. Good luck to everybody coming up. I love to hear about those stories. So all the best. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.